I remember a time uh, of which my mother told me. A time almost as far back as any memory can go. 1896. What a span of donkey's years ago. A time horse-drawn and crossing-swept, with the dignity and decorum set off by all the glory that milliners could devise. When memory and our own times have their beginning, when a century and a reign were approaching their end. What would the oldest among us recall best of the last century? Children's pleasures most likely, holidays by the seaside, the rides along the front on top of one of those new electric tram cars. Oh, the joyous speed of it. The trips on the paddle-wheeled steamers, so right for a child in a sailor hat with a whistle on a velvet string, so wrong for a Mount Flo, forced to lift her skirts and display her ankles. The beaches, bathing huts on wheels, you dare peek her, but you just dare. The donkey rides, the sand castles, just like the Queen's castle at Windsor. And what did they call them? Uh, roller coasters or switchback railways. I'll talk to you about us, ladies and gentlemen. And when the car dropped, how a high collar could bite into the neck. <laughs> The fairgrounds. Oh, but not Menard listening to the band. Ladies do not at any time swing on swings. On so. Agnes Smith. Tonight at supper I shall speak uh, to your father. Going to fairs indeed. I pray you didn't let yourself be trapped into entering one of those disgraceful sideshows. Women in tights, doing absolutely unmentionable things. What next? What next? Sitting on hard benches before one of the first of those whirring uh, um, cinematograph machines. Seeing for a few pennies a miracle. What did it matter what was on the screen so long as it moved? And what did it matter either if uh, sometimes the lettering on the picture was unaccountably back to front? All part of the miracle. Farman saved my child. And among those leaping shadows, often you saw something else. You saw history. A flickering, jumpy scene. Uh, people above your station, Agnes Smith. That carriage arriving at the garden party. An old, old lady being assisted from it. The Queen Agnes. The Queen. Victoria Regina. Long may she continue to reign. A change of reel and... Oh, what's this? Top hats at a funeral. The passing of William Ewart Gladstone. The man the Queen had liked so much less than the dear Mr. Disraeli. Another tuppence. And something even more exciting. Soldiers riding across the African belt. The Boer War. Shadows on the screen. But to you, it was Lady Smith, Colenso, the relief of Mafeking. Soldiers of the Queen, my lad. Goodbye, Dolly Gray. Boots, boots, marching up and down again. It was Duet Kruger and a pressman named Winston Churchill escaping from the Boers. Twenty-five pounds reward, dead or alive. How many thousand horse and foot leading the table bay? Each volunteer a thrill to the heart of every little cap and apron servant girl. The brave, the great, the famous. Cricketers march out into what looks like a snowstorm. 
Oh, but that's only the film. Surely it never snowed in those far-off sunny days? To the British, a beard as famous as any, well, uh, since Moses. The beard of a man now a legend, W.G. Grace. But exciting as those shadows were, they were but newfangled motion pictures. And all around you was reality. What can be more modern than today? Especially when today is 1900. Think of it, the 20th century. The bustle and scurry of a century as fresh as a new pin. If other countries were anything like Britain, they were anthills indeed. For in the great industrial centers of the British Isles, trade and business had never looked better. With the whole world customer for her goods, this was a land humming with activity. Trade and bustle, yet still sharp contrasts of class and wealth. For the laborer, a penny for the tram. Though more often he walked and thought to love it. Factory workers, hardy fishermen and farmers, folks who still worked all the hours of the clock and still touched the forelock to their betters. A Britain at the peak of a hundred years of prosperous expansion. Behind that Ascot elegance was a strength that no other nation could challenge. On the school maps of the world, there was more red than any other color. A red like that of the palace guardsman, for it marked the expanses and extent of Queen Victoria's British Empire. From the snows of Kilimanjaro round the globe to Hong Kong, the wealth of Africa was the Queen's. The wool of her shawl came from Australia or New Zealand, for her men rode from Darwin to Sydney, Wallaroo to, yes, Queen Victoria Springs. For Victoria, they filled the timber of British Columbia and wide Saskatchewan. And woe betide any who broke her laws in the great Northwest. For there, her mounties always got their man. For her, men dodged bullets high in the Khyber Pass, defending the ramparts of Victoria, Empress of India. Their princes, rich enough to buy all England, still bowed their heads to the little lady across the seas. There in the great subcontinent and in neighboring Ceylon and Burma, men and beasts toiled to grow the tea for Victoria's drawing room and the teak for her royal train, the cotton for her throbbing Lancashire mills. Rubber and tin, copper, diamonds, gold and silver, Victoria's empire produced them all. And for those who ran her plantations and defended her wealth from many enemies, oh, what a life it was. A life that, though now passed into history, still haunts the world with its echoes and the words and which have embellished the language. The world of Pune, Delhi, Simla, and the road to Mandalay. Truckers and chota pegs, tiffin and topis, bakka saibs, punkawalas, memories of the mutiny, and a thousand brushes with the godless. Loudly roared the Indian tiger. The Campbells are coming, and you're a better man than I am, Ganga Din. Such was Victoria's empire. A way of life, a state of mind. And whatever one thought of it, a mighty, powerful, impressive structure. Millions upon millions, all together, under the flag upon which the sun never sets. So when Victoria, the widow of Windsor, rode past in her carriage and celebrated her diamond jubilee, the whole world, friend and foe, lifted its cap. Yes, a powerful thing, this empire, and powerful this grip of an old lady upon the world's affairs, and not only within her own realm at that. The German Navy might to all appearance challenge Britain's rule of the seas, but in truth, one false step and the Kaiser would earn a personal dressing down from his British grandmother. For closely entwined into Victoria's family tree were most of Europe's crowned heads 
and any of them at any time were liable to be pruned down to size. Nicholas, Tsar of all the Russias, ruled over every Kulak and Mujik from St. Petersburg to Vladivostok. Yet even Nicholas was not immune from a scathing letter bearing the postmark Windsor Castle. In one country, however, her influence was less strong. For since Napoleon III had been exiled to Britain, France had been a republic. Paris, at the turn of the century. And what a broad-beamed wealth of good living to be found there. The Paris of Offenbach, Renoir, Pasteur, Maximes, and that Moulin Rouge, where, as like as not, you'd find the Prince of Wales, uh, <coughs> to Victoria's displeasure. The Paris of Rodin. Toulouse-Lautrec and Emile Zola. The Paris, too, of Sarah Bernhardt, well and truly enthroned as the queen of the world's theatre. Great days indeed for the arts. And, of course, the Paris then as now, the fashion centre of the world. was the elegance, imported or homemade, of the Victorian sunset. But even while the Queen still lived, there were signs of change. Signs of women breaking out of the prison of home and strict respectability. I ask you, mixed cycling? Oh, the country's going to the dogs, six at a time. Nineteen hundred, a Victorian interior. Whose? The room of a man with scientific bent, that's certain. Elementary, my dear Watson. Popular? Perhaps. But feared by some. Right again, Watson. And isn't that the dummy of himself he placed in the window to foil the sharpshooter in the Moriarty affair? You're improving, Watson, I do declare. The Victoria Regina he traced in bullets in that same final adventure. Tobacco kept in the Persian slipper. His bottle of cocaine. And in the corner, oh yes, of course, the violin. On the wall above, the dancing men. And over on that other wall, the relic of the, oh, what was it termed? The, uh, the speckled band. What a sinister episode. His desk. And among the objects on it are portraits. The one woman in his life. But no names, please. Not long departed. Teapot's still warm. And yet he's left his hypodermic. Has he now? Dear me, Watson, no time to waste. Pray pass me, my dear stalker, and call us a hansom. Adventure. The keynote of Sherlock Holmes, and why not? Even in the changing world of 1900, adventure could still be found for the asking. If you grew weary of pushing a clerk's pen or swinging a navvy's pick, you could still find, oh, plenty of adventure under the sun. For instance, there was still the air to conquer, as yet only balloons and airships had risen into that element. But though the first heavy of an air machine had yet to take off, progress was such that uh, already flying was considered uh, safe for ladies. In moderation, of course. Highly instructive, in fact. Plenty of adventure under the sun. You could still run away to sea and go round the horn in a windjammer. To anyone wanting excitement, the trip could offer plenty. And on ships like this, if you had problems of personal timidity, a rope's end from the mate soon put an end to those. Work as you'd never worked before. Slave your way to new lands where opportunity knocked to find gold nuggets or a pauper's grave. The price of the passage was still the same.
plenty of adventure under the sun. You could still be first at the North Pole or the South, for there no man had yet trod. Only you'd have to make the journey on your own feet and with your own sweat. And no one would know about it until you got back, if you ever did. For those seeking isolation, there remain plenty of places where you could be alone, in the silent wilderness of nature, out of touch with all men. Get rich quick. You could still plant a stake on a diamond or a gold field, but you had to be tough enough to defend it against all comers. Nowadays, it's football pools. You could still be first to conquer any one of a hundred virgin peaks, from the Matterhorn to Everest. Room and scope up there for a stout heart and a strong rope. Plenty of adventure under the sun. Seek oil or a pharaoh's tomb, and what's more, probably find it. For then the odds were more favorable, the competition less. Still strange and wonderful places to discover for science. Still people who had never seen a European, unspoiled and not yet tourist-minded. And if all else failed, well, there was always soldiering for the Queen. For in her service was adventure with some degree of security, as far as pay and food at any rate. Sweating it out in the Sudan, in Africa and India, Defending the flag upon which the sun never sets. Soldiers of the Queen. But then one day in 1901. They were soldiers of the Queen no longer. Even a century must reach its end. Even a Queen who had reigned for 63 years. Don the black and beat the drums. For the Queen was dead. The Queen who had been on the throne for so long that England could hardly credit her death. England wouldn't be the same without the Queen. Behind the gun carriage rode her son, Edward, and representatives of every kingdom in Europe. Europe wouldn't be the same without Victoria. And as at Windsor, they bore the widow to her last resting place. There were many who wondered fearful of change, unsure of the future, unsure of themselves. Yet, paradoxically enough, the reign of Victoria had known greater change in the world than any other 60 years in history. When Victoria was born in 1819, England was toll roads, coaches and stand and deliver. Most of its tiny population still in the cottage, knowing only its village and living only on what it could itself produce. But even before the young princess mounted the throne, mud to cobbles. James Watt had watched a tea kettle, and that was the end of much, ground into oblivion by the power of steam. Stevenson, Brunel, and all aboard. Waterloo had shaped the year of Victoria was born into, and war was to redraw its maps again and again for her passing. Crimea, Sebastopol, Lord Cardigan, and Florence Nightingale. Charged for the guns, they said. French Empire versus Prussian, Bismarck and Sedan. The French monarchy wanes, a new Germany is born, a united Italy created. Yet the strife was seldom Victoria's. So all the while her own realm prospered and swelled to eight times its original size. Revolutions, new tyrannies, new freedoms. In North America, a war between states finally brought forth a new nation, fully united by the people for the people. The wagon trains rolled back the frontiers westward to the Rocky Mountains and beyond. Go west, young man, go west, to seek, find and create. To release new wealth destined one day to outstrip even Victoria's. The potential was there, all that remained was moving forward. 
But the whole century was moving forward in communications, in science, in medicine, reason, and thought, and above all, in industry. Never have there been such expansion. Sprawling, messy, but where there's muck, there's money. At the end of her reign, Victoria saw a transformed world, and all around her were mighty monuments to those who had had vision and courage. A transformed world moving forward with ever-increasing speed. And yet, not the same without the Queen. Goodbye, Victoria. Farewell, a way of life, a state of mind. The Queen is dead. Long live the King. Thus, late in his life, the throne passed to Edward, Prince of Wales. His but ten years, yet nobody could deny that he made the most of them. Then to his son George, who was to know the greatest war. Oh, but uh, that in the future. So Britain made ready for a coronation. A ceremony that at last happened so many years back that most people had forgotten how to crown the monarch. That was the coronation that began the era that the world now calls Edwardian. And that too was a time to be remembered. For as everybody knows, the Edwardian keynote was gaiety. A reaction against the stern, the I am gravely displeased, drink your pot of Elizabeth and earn your father's approval, maybe. Or was it just a part of the inevitable progress? A change of social order a little delayed by a greatly loved, but rather formidable old lady. Who knows? A new century. Yet all the same, there were many who looked back upon the old days with a sigh and a tear dabbed away with a lace-edged handkerchief. For they had known their moments, these Victorians, amid their aspidestras, Love, love, love. 